In this example, I want to do a simple problem about rotation in a plane. So, let's say we have a disc or a cylinder, and it has a uh, diameter of 3 centimeters, and it is currently rotating at 2900 RPM, and it comes to a stop in 1.4 seconds. Stop in 1.4 seconds. And we, what we want to know is how many complete revolutions does this cylinder uh, go while it comes to rest? Okay, how many complete revolutions? How many revolutions? Okay, so uh, we have an angular, I identify here my, my 2900 revolutions per minute as my um, uh, angular frequency, and I do end up uh, same number of revolutions, so it occurs to me I might be able to stay in units of revolutions per minute, but I just, I'm going to, first of all, I'm just going to head and convert that, I like working in radians per second, so if I go... 2900 revolutions per minute times 2 pi over 60, where 2 pi is then my uh, radians per revolution, and 60, of course, is seconds per minute. I'm going to be able to convert to uh, radians per second, and I get 303.69 radians per second. I like to keep a fair number of significant figures when I do internal calculations uh, that and then end up rounding to the proper number of significant figures at the end so I don't have sort of rounding error. And so I, I'm just sort of uh, you know brainstorming at the moment looking at what I know I'm converting to SI. So let's let's go back at um, to get a good picture of what's going on. So I get back to, to visualization. So what's happening to this object? So it's currently rotating. Uh, let's give ourselves a positive uh, angular velocity. So let's give ourselves sort of a right-handed coordinate system. If that's plus x, uh, up is uh, plus y. For this to be a positive rotation, it's going to be rotating counterclockwise with positive angular frequency. And so I we have a constant, I'm assuming a constant acceleration, a constant, well in this case, deceleration. And so um, to do this, I could use our constant kinematic equations for rotational motion. So to do that, I want to identify two points in time at which I can then use our constant kinematic relationships between initial and final uh, angle and angular frequency. And so remember that we can use the procedure from here on out follows nearly exactly what we did for one dimensional kinematics, just with different terms. And we're able to do that because the relationships between angle and angular velocity and angular acceleration are exactly the same as the relationships between position velocity and acceleration. That is, the, the velocity is the derivative of the position and the acceleration of the derivative of the velocity. Okay, so that leads us to our, our strategy, which is I need to clearly identify two points in time, and I think that's obvious from this, which is the, uh, the start of the deceleration, and then when the object comes to rest. I'm writing kind of small there, I hope people can see that. I'll try to write larger. Okay, so these are my two points in time. Let's um, identify what we know. Our first is our then our initial angle, and again, just we get to choose our coordinate system and our origin. So I'm going to choose the initial angle to be zero, and then there's sort of some final angle that the object is. You know, if I start with this uh, axis here to be along the x-axis to be the measure of my angle. So where that axis ends up when the, when the object finally comes to rest is unknown. My initial frequency, 
then uh, angular frequency, I know. Angular velocity. <laughs> yes, I, I go back, I apologize, I go back and forth, and my mind between the oscillations and the rotations are so related, I'll, I'll call a switch between angular velocity and frequency. But let, let's call this angular velocity is uh, that we know in radians per second. And we know our final angular velocity, which is zero. Our angular acceleration is unknown. And we know, well, our initial time, we get to choose our time coordinate. So I'm going to choose that to be zero. And my final time we know is a 1.4 seconds. All right, so we, we know a fair amount. We're still missing our uh, final position and our angular acceleration. It seems to me that we're not going to get too far until we find our angular acceleration, so I'm going to go for that first, which is pretty easy because I know both the initial and final um, angular velocity as well, as well as the time. And so I know that my final angular velocity is equal to my initial angular velocity plus my excel angular acceleration times the time interval for constant angular acceleration. And so this is pretty easy enough to solve. This is 3, I said 69 plus alpha and then my time interval. My time, time interval is here. Delta t of course just 1.4 minus 0, 1.4. So I can solve that for alpha. Alpha is then equal to, if I bring, oh, my final, of course, is, is 0. Is equal to the negative 303.69 divided by 1.4 is negative 216. Whoop. 16.92. Again, I'm keeping a fair number of significant figures here in my internal calculation. I'll bring it down to a reasonable number at the end. All right, so now I have my angular acceleration negative to 16.92. And now let's proceed to the angle. From the kinematics, I know our final angle is equal to the initial angle plus the initial angular velocity times the time interval plus one half angular acceleration times the time interval squared and I now know all of these parameters this is 0, 3, 0.3, 0.3.69 the time interval is 1.4 minus one half well right, minus 216.92 times 1.4 squared and if I plug that into my calculator at least I get 273 and this is radians because everything was in uh, radians per second and so angular with velocity then was in radians per second squared and so my answer now is in radians I'm not interested in radians well I'm a little interested but the the uh, uh, it calls for uh, full revolutions, and so there is uh, one revolution in 2 pi radians, and so 273 radians is 43, ah, not 4.3, 43.5, or 43 full revolutions. And there we go.